Welcome to another episode of Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. I'm your host, Brother Gustavo. For those who are not familiar with the Heralds, the Heralds of the Gospel are a community active in the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto, as well as several other cities across Canada. Founded by Monsignor Jean Cladias, the Heralds comprise priests, religious, brothers and sisters, and lay people since their pontifical recognition in 2001 by Pope John Paul II. And for those who are familiar with the Heralds, this podcast features the talks following the Heralds' weekly rosary at St. Patrick's Parish in Schomburg, Ontario, where the brothers share some consoling and encouraging thoughts precisely geared to those dreaded beginnings of a probably hard week called Mondays. If you want to know more about the origin of the podcast, please stop right here. Go back and listen to episode number one. So even if today it's not Monday, but you're still commuting or doing chores, take heart brighten your perspectives and enjoy today's talk recorded at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg. The topic, the origin of the world's disasters, part one, the great fall, with Brother Justin Bonia. Welcome then to Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Well, welcome to another episode of Magical Mondays. And unfortunately, we're not in the Church of St. Patrick's after we've prayed our rosary. But today you find us, or find me at least, in the community house of the Heralds of the Gospel found in Schomburg, Ontario. Today, I'm going to be speaking about a subject which is a little bit different than the current uh, line that Brother Gustavo has been uh, following, but to give it a little bit of diversity and and what have you, I just wanted to... Uh, change is good, mostly in these days of quarantine. This weekend, we were doing uh, catechesis via Zoom, and... Um, with my group, we were exploring something which is fascinating, and I wished in the few minutes we have today to begin to look at it. When we look at the great fall of Adam and Eve, the great sin, the original sin, Sometimes we don't put it in its proper location, in its proper place, and we tend to look at the sin of Adam and Eve as a one-off or the beginning of bad news, the beginning of the flawed humanity that we all share in. But I find, and it's interesting, uh, children tend to be very um, logical in this sense that they 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 call that point out and they say, but that's not the beginning. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ when he's looking at the question of divorce with the um, with the Pharisees when they and the Sadducees and they're setting him up to uh, possibly make a mistake as they so believe, and which they find out very quickly that um, the divine master has spun around and thrown them into the mud in the most spectacular manner. And I'm talking about the story of the woman with the seven brotherly uh, husbands, each one dying, and the obligation to raise up children. Therefore, she marries each one of the, uh, the sons, and whom would be her husband for eternity. And our Lord uh, talks about marriage, and he says very succinctly, and this is something that John Paul II talks about in his Theology of the Body also, that our Lord is very quick to say, the problem is in the beginning. So, 
the reason for us to study the Gospels is awesome. It's the word of life, etc., etc., the good news. But we also have, have to have a good knowledge of our Old Testament, and particularly the books of the Old Testament, and particularly the beginning of Genesis. Because Genesis gives us where everything went wrong. And when everything goes wrong, it's good to peel it open. But what's fascinating is that the cookie crumbs to figure out where everything went wrong is found throughout the Gospels. Without the Bible, uh, the book of Jude is found in Exodus. It's found, but in a special way, it's found in Revelations, the last book of the Bible. That's why it's comprehensive. That's why it's important that we take a great look. And it's the fall of the angels. And when we look at the fall of the angels, this gives us a peek into the real problem of the fall. So let's start from there, and then the, that will give us the necessary ground to set ourselves up to understand better what happened to Adam and Eve. The choirs of angels are are fascinating, and I hope that another episode will get into the actual nitty gritty of angels. Um, and to get into the whole thing, well, that's a that's something else. But just to give ourselves a good idea, look at the choirs of the angels as traditionally explained by uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas. One of the first points to look at it is that the angels were made with the purpose to govern. The word angel means messenger. Okay, so they're made to govern, and they're messengers of God. And what's interesting, you know, the Martha and Mary uh, dilemma that you see within the Gospels is that the higher they are, the stronger, the more powerful they are, but actually the less practical responsibilities they have the more practical responsibilities fall towards the lower choirs of angels. That's one point that's really fascinating. So we have the two highest, which are the cherubim and the seraphim. Lucifer was the highest of the highest choir of angels. So he was top. He was the perfection of God, you may say, in an angelic form. But God wanted to test. He wanted to see, with all of these gifts, were these creatures of his willing and able to love him? Were they able to use their amazing intellect? What's interesting about angelic intellect is that angelic intellect doesn't go through the thought proceeds that we do. You know, the to and fro, the questioning and counter-question and doubts and all those fantastic things. And because angels don't have it, their intelligence is more like illumination. It's like they step and they know exactly what that purpose is. They know exactly what the consequences would be also. They've weighed and measured a decision. Unlike us humans who tend to falter, and because we are composite beings, that is, made up of a spiritual soul, but a material body, we are in conflict, which works out for our advantage in the sense that we are able to ask for forgiveness, we're able to turn back. Now, according to much of tradition, God reveals that he's going to be incarnate. The second person, the Holy Trinity, is going to be incarnate into humanity. Now, Lucifer, carrier of light, don't forget, light is one of the symbols of God, has an attack of something which I think all of us could uh, very much understand. In our fallen nature, it is something 
incredibly prevalent, incredibly common, which is the vice of envy. And with envy came its cascading evil results. St. Thomas explains it in an interesting manner. And he says that their way of looking at the reality that was being presented to them was something rather interesting. One was called a vespertine, and the other one was called a matrutine vision of creation. So God reveals to them the plan of creation. All that God had in mind for his creation. Maybe say plan A. Lucifer will come to a point where he, he looks at it and he says, if God has this need to incarnate, take on another nature, the best receptacle is myself. Because I am so awesome. You see where the problem is. And when he learns about what humans are going to be and that they're going to have a spiritual, rational souls, but animal bodies, that why not me becomes more of a problem. Now, these two visions, we all, we all have these same, same issues. When we envy our neighbor when they receive graces or when they receive material goods. And we ask that famous quote, why not me? We're echoing Lucifer's beginning of his rejection of God. So what are these two ways? Well, in their discovery of God's creation, they left from knowing themselves, knowing nature. But in the vespertine, or the darkening manner, they kind of do it in reverse. They kind of look towards God, and then come away from God and look towards his creation, his planned creation, or his already made creation. Or her, and then ended with themselves. So, the end of man is to know, love, and serve God, our creator, and be happy with him and in heaven for eternity. But those that were taken by this envy, this comparison, this evil worm, which they did not push away from themselves, began to say, God isn't that special. God isn't that great. And what is God demanding? Well, he's demanding love. In love comes service. Where there's no service, there is no love. And that's why Lucifer's cry of revolt, I will not serve, underlines this element of an absence of love. What is God? God is love. So we see that the very element is confused. We see that it's already broken. And since I already said, angels in their, in their superior intellect, their illumination, they know where this road brings. Now, there's another group of angels, which would be the matrutin, in which they come from self-knowledge. And they're in search of someone to love. They're in search of someone to serve. They're in search of the other Remember what I said about service, where there is service, there is love. And they're looking for someone to serve. They're looking for the love, capital letters. We see this echoed in the writings of the saints. We see this written in a very beautiful manner by Augustine in his Confessions. We see this in the conversion story of, of, of any multitude of saints. He looks in himself. And though he sees beauty, because there was no sin at this point, 
they do see inadequacies. They do see that they could be better. They see that there are points that are not perfect, that there are limits and wants. Then they look towards creation and they begin to admire the creation around them. And that search ends with God. So in the same manner of someone who is looking in a beautiful garden before dawn, and as the sun begins to come up, everything becomes illuminated. And as it illuminates, they begin to admire more and more and more until they reach the sun in its glory. Those souls found God in His. And that had one individual who is like unto God, Michael, who when the words are enunciated, I will not serve, rises up in defense of God. Now, another question is, does God need someone to defend him? In absolutes? No. But since God is love, and God gives his love, and is looking for love in return, the act of defense is the ultimate sign of loyalty and of love. Lucifer, who had self-admired himself, did not perceive by his break with God, with the supreme good, supreme love, the supreme of everything. And anything that Lucifer had was a mere reflection of what God is. Didn't perceive that he began to become ugly. In the same manner that Michael increased, Satan decreased. In the same manner that Michael charges towards the greatest of the angels, Lucifer descends to his new home, hell. One third of the angels followed Lucifer. One third failed their test. Two thirds passed. But what's fascinating about the battle of heaven, and this is something that we find in private revelation, is that there was another group Another fragment, another section, a lot, considering that, again, um, the sacred writers say that the analogy that our Lord Jesus Christ uses about the lost lamb being a 99 to 1 ratio is, uh, is meant to be that Jesus left the 99 faithful in heaven in search of the one who was human. The ratio is skewered in that dimension. The angel, the, the angelic roles show themselves so brightly. Now, there are different um, interpretations on the role of St. Michael. Was St. Michael a seraphim like Lucifer? Was he a cherubim? Was he a throne or principality or power? Was the term archangel meant he was the above all angels? Or was he a member of the second lowest choir of angels, the archangels? We do not know for certain. But in this analogy, in this image that I've that I've described, the one in which he is the second lowest choir filled with admiration and grows with his love to take the spot of Lucifer. Fits better. Lucifer is cast into hell. Now, if you've ever known anyone who was envious in your life, it doesn't tend to be a passing fancy. It doesn't happen that it goes away easily. It takes a lot of spiritual combat. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of difficulty. It's a lifetime at work. That image is something we can reflect on this demon. 
what had happened was that he had made a decision and he will not change because he knew what the consequences were. But his love became hate, or I'd say his absence of love became the most terrible hate. His envy devoured him like a green worm. John Milton, in his Paradise Loss, outlines these roles of Lucifer. And it's a rather interesting read to look at things on a different script. The re- he goes to the psychology of Lucifer. And that line, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven, is one that should be used to understand why Lucifer will never change, will never turn back. How many times do you hear that? What's interesting is I hear that from adults very, very commonly, but very rarely from children. And I find that interesting when I'm teaching catechism to children. They don't ask that question. But when I move to teens and adults that question comes up much more often. It seems children with their innocence understand the gravity of the sin committed, the gravity of the rejection. Now, I've gone on now for almost 20 minutes about this, and I can go on for another 100 if necessary, but I won't do that to you. But we want to look at this very key point, which is the great enemy of mankind is Satan is Lucifer. He was envious at the beginning, and he doesn't cease to be. But what does he want to destroy? He wants to destroy that most precious gift that gives humans the dignity in which we all share, which is being images of God. So I'm going to stop us now And next week, I'm going to do a part two in which we're going to drag out the story from the angels. But move us into, move us into the great fall and to see how much sadness the choice of self over God brings. May God bless you all. And let's finish with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. Salve Maria. And this is all for today's episode recorded live at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg, Ontario. You can reach us anytime at one of the Heralds websites, such as heralds.ca forward slash podcast, New Insights Multimedia forward slash podcast, or you can also subscribe on iTunes or anywhere you normally listen to your favorite podcast. And as per now, pray hard, work hard, keep growing in devotion to the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother, evangelize by word and example, and be every day more and more a real herald of the gospel.